Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to Open Themes. Um, for those who don't know us, um, Open Themes is a group of Sudanese intellectuals and activists whose main aim is to promote for um, democracy, human rights, and secularism. Although the group is primarily seized with intellectual matters, it's um, fully aware of the inter um, interconnections with political, social, and cultural spheres. The group was established in 2009, and we're based in London. We're super delighted today to have the award-winning multimedia producer, curator, and educator leader, Frederick. Frederick has more than 15 years in experience in um, media creative industries in sub-Saharan Africa and Europe with a strong interest in post-conflict recovery, geopolitics, cultural heritage, and for countries in crisis and uh, transition, which I'm sure you all agree Sudan makes a perfect example of. Um, she had participated in many group exhibitions, um, has her uh, own um, solo exhibitions as well. Um, I can mention one example, Disappearing Heritage of Sudan, 1820 to 1956, had been exhibited in uh, Abdel Karim Marghani Culture in Sudan and in uh, Brunei Gallery and Oriental Museum, both in UK. The film in question today, Jews and the Longest Kiss in History, which by the way um, coincided with the UK Jewish Film Festival between 6th and 20, 21st of November. Uh, I don't want to give away any information about the film. Let's watch it and then have a break and Q&A with Frederick, shall we? We are Arabs, of course, that were under government, government. They felt more related to the rest of the Arabs who joined the Arab League, and they felt that they have to participate in whatever the Arab League is doing against Israel. Sudan increasingly saw itself as an Arab country after independence. You know, although having a very large non-Arab population, uh, on the whole, the government has been in the hands of Arabs, and they've aligned. They've seen their interests aligned with those of other Arab countries. But they came from Nasser, and I remember I was sitting about ten meters away from Nasser, and of course, all this thanks to El Mahdi, Say Sadiq El Mahdi, who, who was at the time the leader of the Ummah Party, and he had very good relations with the Jews. Just to show you that the Sudanese people really were not bad with Jews at the time. We were able, I was able to invite the president, at the time, at that time it's called Ashari, to come to the party. So it was, but it still remained a couple of years after that, the club and the help at home and all that kind of luxury that you can really create in any in any time, and, you know, like before. But after that, eventually, also for the Jews, it was so bad that everybody started to leave. Slowly, slowly, they vanished, one by one. In a couple of years, there were almost no Jews there. And they all went to England, to Switzerland, to the States, like they did Malta. Everybody followed. My wife felt unsafe because of threats to her. They're going to take our children. We cannot. I am going to leave here and you can make all the money you want and you follow me whenever you want. I'm going to live with my sister in Yorkshire. Jews in Arab countries, after the existence, especially after the existence of Israel, are persona non grata. We were born there, grandparents were there, my father was there. We lived all our lives as Sudanese, and our feelings for our country was more than anywhere else. We didn't interfere in politics. I would have never left the Sudan had it not been that I have been pre-warned by my partner, who is a Sudanese. And, and that's partly because Sudanese governments, especially from the end of the 1960s, became increasingly controlling. <laughs> when the Sudan took independence and confiscated all the properties of Jewish people, they 
uh, my brother and his family and my family all together, whoever was in Sudan, uh, they left and went to England and left behind them a very big uh, amount of fortune. You know, like in all countries, politically, political, that means the individual like myself has to be sacrificed for a more important target, which we think is in the interest of the nation. If they thought that it is in the interest of the nation to join the Arab League and to be nice with the Egyptians and so on. And he helped me get my exit permit to get out. That's the Minister of Foreign Affairs. All the Jews were going away and everybody needed the certificate <coughs> from the Jewish community. It helps. This little piece of paper has to be given by the Secretary of the Community, stamped and given to the very small paper. I had to give it to dozens and dozens of people who were coming. And when I went to Nigeria, in the Sudan, there was in the official gazette the withdrawal of our, of mine and my cousin's citizenship in the Sudan. So they cancelled our passports. I became stateless, and of course it took me some time until I got a United Nations refugee passport, which I have got up to today. But of course, things, things have changed. In me. Welcome back. Uh... Well, it was a very emotional film, at least for me. Um, I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts and if you have any comments or any uh, questions for Frederick. We'll have a microphone that's going around, but it's only linked to the camera. So um, shout as well so the people in the uh, room can hear you. Uh, I'd like to give Frederick just a chance to say whatever you want before people get um, ask questions. And yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you for coming. And uh, as Arish said, it's always uh, very emotional to uh, look back at this film. Uh, so we've made this film around 2010. It took about two years to travel around the different countries. But first of all, it all started uh, when I went, so I went to Sudan many times. Uh, before I did this film, I was working on other projects, other films. And uh, while I was in Khartoum, I think uh, probably in 2007 or 2008, I was downtown and I saw this shop, uh, Maurice Goldenberg uh, Optician Shop. And this is uh, what triggered uh, uh, my interest to, to know more about uh, the Sudanese Jewish community because I knew nothing about it at the time. So I did some research, I questioned uh, some of my friends. Uh, at the time I was doing the film with Jadala Jubara, so he had a lot of uh, memories about uh, the Jews of Sudan and the Armenians, and I mean all the communities that we talked about in the film. And also um, I found this book, which is uh, quite well known, uh, written by Eli Malka, who was one of the son of the rabbi. And uh, then I um, made contact with, I mean, it, it took a long time, but I managed to make contact with um, people from the community, from the Sudanese Jewish community. And I got in touch with uh, David Malka, who wrote this book. And also, I wanted to pay tribute to David Malka and to dedicate this uh, film screening to, to him because sadly he passed away two weeks ago. And uh, so I'm still in touch with his family. And uh, when I told them that we were having a, f a film screening and I wanted to dedicate that film screening to him, they were very touched. And I received some really <coughs> nice messages from, uh, from his relatives. So David Malka was key to uh, this project. Uh, he basically put me in contact with uh, all the people across uh, Europe, uh, Israel, uh, Geneva, I mean, you name it. Uh, and we also uh, did a fundraising campaign to finance the film. So this is how we, we did it. Uh, I had full editorial control 
they didn't tell me, you know, what to put, what to change. Uh, I mean, wh whoever was interviewed agreed to be uh, fully uh, participating uh, in that film. And then um, I tried to interview people in Sudan uh, about the topic. And uh, because of the situation of Sudan at that time, it was very difficult to even to, to go from one place to another who was related to the former Sudanese Jewish community. Like, I couldn't tell the driver I wanted to go to the cemetery. I tried once, I said to the driver, please, can you stop here? And he was like, no, 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 there's no way I can stop here in front of the cemetery. So the first attempt failed, and then the second time, I thought, okay, I'm going to tell the driver to drop me like 200 meters away from the cemetery. But then again, I mean, there was always suspicions. People were not very, you know, at ease. Uh, there were, I know everybody knows that there, there are maybe two people from the former Jewish community left in Sudan. I couldn't meet them. Uh, they were not feeling secure, and uh, or even people with a distant connection with the uh, Sudanese uh, Jewish heritage. I mean, it was impossible. So that's why uh, this film is mainly, you know, from the side of the Sudanese Jew. I wanted to have more Sudanese people to be involved, but so that was the major obstacle for that film. But otherwise, uh, when I was doing the filming officially in Sudan, I was not filming for the purpose of that film. I was always working on, on a different project. And the story built up uh, slowly after visiting one country, for example, America. I gather all the interviews. And then in between, I would go back to Sudan for another project and complete, complete the filming for the Jews of Sudan film, you know, and this and that. So this is how the film was made over a period of two years, I think. And, um, and I'm very proud of that film. <laughs> I think it's a very it good film. Yeah, it's, it's a, a great film, yeah. For, for uh, the Sudanese people first, and, uh, and it's very good to see that um, there always been an interest in Sudan to see the film, but I know there was a couple of private film screening as well. It couldn't be made officially, so, uh, but I know now things will be different. So, uh, yeah, so you're most welcome to ask questions. Yeah, we hope so. We hope now is a good time to screen in Sudan. Anyone wants to say anything? Thank you, Frederic, for the film. It was, it was really fascinating. Um, I wonder what happened. Is this work? It's not, it's just it's for the camera. It's like a, it's <laughs> like a it's for the purpose of the oh, camera. Okay. Um, I wonder, um, y you filmed at the cemetery in, the, in, in Sudan, <coughs> and the graves were desecrated. What happened? What's happened to it now? Do you know the cemetery? What's happened to all the graves? So, uh, I haven't been to the cemetery for a couple of years, but I guess it's still there. Uh, it was not in a very good state last time I saw it, but I know there was a campaign uh, for cleaning the cemetery like two years ago, something like that. So uh, some remains are still there, but what happened in... 79 or something like that uh, is um, a group of uh, Jewish families, uh, mainly based in New York and Geneva, wanted to have the remains of, you know, the relatives, uh, relatives to be <coughs> moved f from Sudan to Israel, where they set up a plot uh, for the Jewish community. And also the purpose of that mission was to um, remove the remains of the rabbi. Uh, you know, so that's an initiative organized by the Malka family and other families. So this is how they created, in a way, a Sudan Jewish cemetery in Israel like a small plot, you know, for them. So they moved, I think, about 25 bodies. Yeah, and it was... So I interviewed the man who organized the, the mission. But then when I edited the film, um, it felt really odd to add this story. 
because mm -hmm. it was going into a different direction. So it's very interesting the way they organized this because, you know, uh, they had to get official, I mean, non-official permissions with the, the president at the time. Uh, they had to organize a, a plane, uh, workers, you know, to, to do all the work. Uh, I mean, imagine. So it, and they did it overnight. Yeah, it looks like they did it overnight. They kind of le looks like they left rather a mess behind. So I wonder what's happened to those open tombs. No, they yeah, there is a mix of, you know, tombs who are non-touched, and then there was the one who were, were open, but then I think they, they, you know, they just left them like that. And when I saw the symmetry like 20 years later, I mean, you know, it was mainly dust everywhere. and. Mm -hmm. you know, layers of rubbish and, you know, so, yeah. <coughs> Chance for another person? Yes. Come back to you. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Farooq Abdurrahman. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the film. Okay. Actually, it means something to me because I have been always interested in this subject as a Sudanese and then as a diplomat, former diplomat. And uh, actually, I happen to have read that book, the first one yeah. of Eli Malka, Eliyahu Malka. It's a very interesting book. And I, um, I think I was the person who took the book first time to Sudan in 2003. Somebody gave it to me in Jordan, in, in Jordan, in Amman, and I took it to Sudan. I, I happened to have met Sadiq Al Mahdi that time, and I asked him if he had seen the book. He said no. So I lent it to him, and he read it and sent it back to me, and then I took it back to the owner. That was all in 2003. I think it is a good book, and actually I did want to meet the writer, the author. But uh, I discovered that he was in his last year or something in New York. I could not get in touch with him. And later on, I got the news that he died. Because I wanted to actually to, to talk to him about certain things in the book. He did say a few things that were mentioned here in the film, that he was happy in Sudan. He was born in Omdurman, 1909. Uh, and then he spoke about Omdurman, Khartoum, and then everything. And then uh, the Jalat Lihanki company. He, wa he happened to be a senior man in that company. And th th he, he, he did tell a, a few things in the book. But then, of course, he spoke also about the new Sudan, the independent Sudan, and the, uh, the question of Palestine, which is still alive. And then, uh, about his uh, departure from Khartoum to Switzerland and then to United States. And actually, uh, I did visit, because uh, it could be, a, could be an answer to your question, I did see the, the cemetery many times. Last, last January this year, Good. I was in Sudan, and uh, I did go and had a look at it. And uh, at one time, it was in very bad shape. Mm -hmm because it is in the industrial area of Khartoum. Uh, some people would throw rubbish inside. They don't mean it, but it's just an empty place. I don't think they are really, because they think that this is a Jewish cemetery and they have to desecrate it. No, 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 no. it is just a place where some dogs and other people, you know, they just go inside and some of those people re re uh, throw things. Uh, later on I came and I found that it has been rebuilt. A third time, which is the last time I was there, I managed to get inside again, and the number of graves has reduced. I think there were about 16 of them. Mm. I think the last time I was there, there were only about seven or eight. And I always looked at the, the grave uh, stone, and I read, I read the names. Actually, it was interesting, because sometimes it is written in three languages, in Jewish, Hebrew, in Arabic and in French for you. <laughs> anyway, 
Some of them, of course, are written in English. But this is the situation. And in the book, Mr. Melka would say that he transferred the, uh, the remains of his former wife and the child to Israel. They got permission from Nimeri and the government that they can remove them and take them to Israel, but not directly. They have to go through another European country. That's why they went to Switzerland or Greece, I don't know. Anyway, the book is itself <laughs> contains number names and positions of people, and I have been always interested in a certain person. It's a lady who was my classmate in University of Khartoum. Her name is it's there in the book. She got married in 1963, Viola Cohen. And I don't know if she's still alive or not. But anyway, the question continues to be interesting. And I think the film is a very good film. I'm trying to buy one or keep one. And I would like, actually, two days ago, I said to myself, I must get the book again. <laughs> so I don't know where I can get it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to comment, or shall I give uh, Amparo a chance? Best? I'm glad to know that mm. the symmetry is in a better shape. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But, uh, but as you said, people uh, the, the people didn't know it was a, a, a grave. Actually, no, they don't. They don't know. I think all the cemeteries in Sudan are not well kept. Unfortunately, we don't have that tradition. Yeah, it's it's just not the same. Um, yeah. I think just the climate is difficult different you know if you go to Farouk uh, cemetery it's appalling I, I was appalled mm. yeah so you know I don't think it's just only the Jewish uh, cemeteries yeah, yeah, no, anyway um, Frederick thank you so much for making this yeah. film I think really thinking that you did this about 10 years ago is just uh, something because I came across the book I think sometime in 2003, 4, 5, something like this, and I got copies of the book. And uh, I, I think for me, uh, growing up in New York, but uh, having a lot of Jewish friends, and obviously very much aware of the politics of in the Middle East, but not aware of the Arab Jews. And it was really m not until I was in much older that I was aware of uh, the so-called Arab Jews, and uh, you know, I became very much interested in, in, in the Jewish communities in, in the Middle East and, and how they were affected, and um, wasn't aware, of course, also about the Sudanese uh, Jewish community. And I think because of the political climate, it, it's a rather difficult subject uh, to, to broach. Uh, but uh, interestingly, that there have been articles, and I think even a talk show, um, in Sudan to to talk about it, but of course, uh, given the climate of you know during uh, Bashir's rule anyway, um, and the intolerance, I think uh, religious intolerance, I think it, it, it's a very difficult subject to to broach. So really, very courageous of you to have done this. Thank you. So what is on Farouk? Thank you. My name is Farouk Fadur. I'm very sorry that I missed your film. Yes. Can I, before I begin to talk, can I ask you two questions? Yes. Have your film included the name of Israel Daoud Benjamin? Probably not. No. Has it included Raoul, the chief financial manager of Osama Daoud's enterprise? No, but there is a reason for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> As I said, on my father's side, I belong to the great Nubian kingdom. I'm a Dongolawi. My father, his parents are both Dongolawi. My father, I think, committed a revolutionary thing. A man whose pa parents are Danagla. He would probably ex would be expected, that was way back in the early 1930s, he would probably be expected to marry his cousin, if not his cousin, his second cousin, the neighbor or whatever. But he married my mother. My mother, father was a Jew from Iraq. And, and her mother was a Dinka 
from Sudan, Sudan. So on the, on the right, on my mother's side, we belong to the most oppressed places in, in the world. Yes. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you about my grandmother at another occasion. But I'll tell you about Israel, the Dawood bin Yamin. He came to Sudan before the Wadiya, when the Sudan was ruled by the Turks and awful Egyptians. And as a trader, I don't know what sort of trade, he might well have been a slave trader. When the Mahdiya took over, Khalifa Abdullah was a very cruel man. He, asked, uh, he offered these people to, to, his, his, to, to, go, to, take, to take Islam and to marry Sudanese women. And so my granddad married Umm Ibrahim, the Dinka woman. He, she might well have been his slave, I don't know. But he married her, and he had my uncles, and my mom, and my aunts. He was a, I, I, obviously I have never met him, but he was a rich man. He lived in Omdurman. He had a horse racing stable when a Sayyid Abdurrahman and all these parvenus didn't have that thing. And he had dealings with Ali Dinar when the Sultanate of Ali Dinar was still well established. Unfortunately, he, I think if he, was, he delayed going there for a few months, but the same year that the, the, the British conquered the, uh, Ali Dinar's Sultanate, he went to, he owed, uh, uh, Ali Dinar owed him some money. So he went to get his money. Ali Dinar at that time was very cagey about what the British were trying to do. So he gave him his money. But obviously, on his way, on those days, people would travel on donkeys or horses or whatever. And he, he gets his people. He was murdered on his way back to Omdurman. I don't know whether he, obviously, he became a Muslim under the Mahdiya. I'm not quite sure if he has converted again to Judaism or not. But my, my Dinka grandmom and my brother, my uncles and aunts and my mom all became Muslims. I don't know when they became Muslims. And they were great people. My, my, <laughs> my elder uncle was one, a member of the first committee of the Congress of the Sudan. And he was a leader, was a, one of the people who enjoyed, uh, who be belonged to the national movement that eventually led to the independence. My other uncle was an engineer, a civil, civil engineer, and another one, the young man, I think he was looking after financial things, but, but he also looked after the stable. And he, was, he died when, when he was riding one of the horses, and the horse went berserk, and he killed him as a very young man. Uh, so I bought this book by Malaka, but I was told that he didn't, he didn't know about my granddad, so I didn't read it. I'm sorry that you didn't know about my <laughs> granddad. Uh, and, well, I think that's probably all I want to know uh, all you, I wanted to know, and I wanted to know I belong to predominantly left-wing family, headed by the, great, the greatest black African woman of our times, Fatima Ahmed Ibrahim. And my family suffered a lot under the dictatorships of Abud, Nameri, and obviously the awful Al-Bashir. Even, even our in-laws suffered. Shafi Ahmed al-Sheikh, was Fatima's husband, was murdered by Numeri. Babikr al-Nur, the father of Huda Babikr al-Nur, who is one of our in-laws, was, was married, was also killed by Numeri. And Mustafa Saleh al-Abdabi, who is married to my, uh, my, uh, my cousin, 
went underground during that reign of terror, during the Mary's, uh, and he, he had an acute abdominal condition because he didn't have medical treatment. He died there, and we regard him as a martyr, just like the others. The only time that somebody from the family to, 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 to martyr, to, to die, was Dr. Babikar Abdul Hamid Babikar Salama, who was murdered on the great Buri demonstration some months ago. And we, all, we are very sad about it, but we are very proud of him. Yeah. And we are very proud of our people. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to, to be bragging about my family, but uh, that's by the by. I, I, I just wanted, uh, I, I, I want somebody who writes about the Jews to write about my dad, granddad rather. And thank you very much. You've indeed. got the right person here. Thank you so much, Sean for you, sharing all these lovely thoughts. I think you're going to enjoy the film. It did touch on some of the aspects that you were speaking about, so I'm, I'm hoping you're going to enjoy it. Uh, we've got, yeah, we've got lots of time. Thank you very much, Federico. It was an amazing film. Um, didn't know anything about Jewish, Jewish people in Sudan. So through the life histories, I learned a lot from about the, the, the history of Sudan, but as well as how, how you know, the, the foreign policy of Israel and other Arab countries affected their families. So it was really impressive and interesting. Um, I wanted to know how they are doing in their countries right now, mostly Switzerland, UK, and United States. I mean, you, you touched on the kind of jobs these people had while they were in Sudan, typists for women and working in the office and also the traders. I mean, what kind of jobs are they doing now? And do they, does it have any, anything to do with what they were doing before? in Sudan, um, there is a history to it. Um, the second thing is, I, I wrote this to you in a message, but um, did you have a chance to talk to them after the revolution? Because the first, one of the first things that the Minister of Religious Affairs said was to welcome back these Jewish people. Do they, I mean, I, of course, maybe now that they seem they're quite settled in their countries, they probably don't think about it um, realistically, but that's to them, you know? So to see their face in, in your film was, you know, amazing also. So I just wanted to know whether you had that chance to talk to them. Uh, in regards to the first question, uh, so I have to say, you know, uh, most of the people that I've met uh, are doing very well. Uh, so the ones who were like traders or in business, you know, in Sudan, uh, they were clever enough uh, before they left Sudan to, to do international business. So they probably lost a lot of assets and business in Sudan, but they continue what they already established abroad. So um, as one lady said in the film, you know, the one who were already well established, uh, they went to New York or Geneva or they came here and they just kind of continued the business that they already you know, established before, uh, you know, at a different level and a different scale, uh, different directions, but they just continue to grow from, from that. And then you, you had a lot of people who studied uh, engineering or medicine or, but you know, the, 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 a lot of them are in these uh, fields. And then, um, and then when Janet said that, you know, the one who went to Israel are the one who were uh, standard or below standards, uh, that was like, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. And, uh, you know, then they had children. Uh, so they're also well established in Israel. So on that point, you know, I think they, they succeeded. And, uh, and it's due to uh, the education and uh, the values. I mean, th that was also one thing that really um, touched me when I, t when I met the film is that uh, the, the value they carry in, you know, in, in the environment of knowledge and uh, exchange. And uh, it's very en enriching and very warm. And, uh, so um, so that's, that's a very rich environment, anyway. 
Um, in regards to the second question, uh, I did. I made a little survey amongst uh, the people I'm still mm -hmm. in contact with. But so I'm gonna give you like two or three answers that I got from uh, from from my friends. But I think that's the occasion to open, you know, the, the mic to, to the audience on, on that matter. So um, I asked the question, yeah, so uh, have you seen the announcements made by uh, the Minister of Religious Affairs? And what do you think of that? So, um, for example, the people in Geneva kind of avoided to answer. It was like a, a no comment, something like that. And then I got some answers from New York. Uh, a lady said to me, uh, that's the same thing, you know. Uh, as Jews, we've been persecuted, and now the Arabs are asking us, I mean, the Arabs, the government, are asking us to come back. So seems that, you know, they've already been through a similar pattern mm. with other countries. And I think Lawrence can maybe give us some information about that. And then, uh, and then you have other answers like, uh, yeah, we we still got very fond memory of Sudan, and we we love Sudan very much, as it was before. But we know how it, how it became, and it's not as stable as before. It's not the same environment, and it's not a place for us anymore. And. Uh, I think this kind of announcement is not really is not going to have an impact on the Sudanese Jewish community. I think it's mainly for the Sudan, you know, for the new Sudan. Mm -hmm. This announcement is important for Sudanese people and how the new Sudan, you know, is giving a new perspective, you know, and how they're going to now address their past and their heritage and include, you know, the history that has been hidden and wiped out for so many years. So I think it's important for the Sudanese and also for people who are not part of Sudan or people of like, for people like me. I was, you know, really pleased to hear that. So, um, yeah. So the comment just comment. Yes. Um, the, the place we, we lived in, in Omdurman, is called Shar al Arda. Um, there was obviously my own home, my father and mother's home, and my grandfather, the Dungulawi, there, and an in-law of my grandfather, and a few, one or two other Muslim people. But the majority of the people there were Jewish. Yeah, have, you, have you had anything to do about Basuni? Basuni family. Basuni yeah. was the Chacham of the Jews during the Mahdiya and after that. And his family lived there. Yeah. His, do his granddaughter is called Shirley. She, she trained medicine in Sudan and I think she, she, I don't know where she is, she might be, might be, well be in Israel. Uh, um, then there is Eli Salamon Tamam, yeah. one of the eldest of the Jewish. And he was, a, uh, was one of uh, one of the three, uh, he had a shop in, in Omdurman. And then there is his son-in-law, Dawood Ishaq, yes. and the, his wife, Laura. Yes. yes. So we, and I, I only so now heard that our neighborhood was called Harat al-Yahud, the neighborhood of the Jews. I yeah. didn't know that. Uh, and going back to my Denka grandmother for a minute. Do you know that she was known, she was, she was known as Umm Ibrahim, the mother of Ibrahim, yes. her eldest brother? Do you know why? No. Because of a prejudice against black people. With e we, even we <laughs> didn't know her. her de I only knew her, her Denka name only recently. Her her name was Adot, a great Dinka name, and I'm very proud of her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence, do, do you want to give us some information? Oh, yes. Thanks. Yes. So uh, just to <coughs> say something, uh, Lawrence, uh, we work together on, on this film. So, yes, uh, my, my thanks name. Thanks for coming, Lawrence. Thank you very much for having me, and it's lovely to see the film.
No, Lawrence is a journalist. I'm a journalist and researcher. Do you want to go if there? If you're comfortable there, that's fine. I'm, I'm <laughs> fine here. Can you, yeah. if you can hear me, if my voice is not so strong. Um, yes, I was privileged to, to be working with uh, Frederick on the film, and every time I see the film, I see something new, and that's a credit to a film, as a certain message. Um, m maybe I'll just comment on the, the minister's yeah. uh, comment. I, I don't have too much more to say, and then after that, I might just make one or two other interesting, I hope, comments. Um, no, like you, I, I welcome the fact that he he's acknowledging the, the the Jewish contribution to the life of Sudan and the people who were there. Um, as for practical reaction, I don't think many Jews are going to return to S Sudan. I think obviously not. Perhaps the purpose, in a way, is to make a breach of the past. Where for the past thirty years to say such a thing would be unthinkable, and this is a way of signalling. I imagine but you would know better, to Sudanese people. We're now living in a new era where we can adopt a more pluralistic and uh, less ideologically rigid uh, attitude. Um, just to put things in context, a similar remarks were made in Iraq by the Shia leader Muqtada al-Sadr, mm -hmm. who also said Jews must come back. And it's significant coming from him, from a very mm -hmm. um, orthodox Shia position. But in that context, again, in some sense, he might be Stri striking a stance against um, against his enemies, including in Iran. Mentioning Iran, my friend has just reminded me that actually Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader of Iran, has also said Jews can come back to Iran, but not Israelis. So of course the whole Israeli is Jewish paradigm comes comes into play. Um, and following that theme, um, what I noticed in the film was extraordinary because I've written a book about Jewish history. And it fascinates me to see how communities arrive and then disappear or reappear elsewhere. Because that's very much a story of Jewish life over the ages. I'm not going to say it's a tragedy, it's just the way it is. And in a sense, I think most of us in this room, I am for one, are, are immigrants to this country. And um, that's often been the story of Jewish people, the concept of a diaspora, of leaving a place, going to live somewhere for hundreds of years sometimes, um, is now a commonplace throughout much of the world, but in fact the Jews, whether they chose to or not, were very often amongst the, f the first. Just a few comments, very briefly, um, on, the, on the community in question. It wasn't of very long duration. I mean, if you go to Egypt, there's a Jewish community that goes back to 500 BC, or if you go to Iraq, or uh, even in Germany, it's a thousand years old. This one was only 150 years, you know, 32 people left. And yet, despite that, what strikes me is the pride that the people interviewed say about being Sudanese. It's part, I mean, it's very significant that they would choose a plot of land in uh, Givat Shmuel, the, the state cemetery in Jerusalem, and actually say, this is us, the Sudanese, because they came from all over. Mm -hmm. I mean, th originally they came from Iraq and from Morocco, and we were talking about the family um, Mandil, which used to be either Mendel or, or Mandel, of course, they were the, 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 which means almond in German. Mm -hmm. And so they ori originally were Ashkenazi, like the... Uh, the ophthalmologist, we, you know, the the the, the Morris Goldenberg. Goldenberg. So, uh, so while most of the Jews of Sudan were very much from the region, there were some that came from Germany, spoke Yiddish and German, and yet they became Sudanese in a way. Um, but it's, it's also a sad story because, yet it's in their hearts and they still regard themselves as Sudanese. And yet, if you said, do you want to come back to the country, the life goes on and people people develop new relationships. Those are just some ob observations. Um, and also people want to ask about the music. I, I think my only great contribution to the film <laughs> was to recommend the singer. <laughs> I think apart oh from yeah. that, I didn't do much. But um, the singer uh, happens to be of Iraqi Jewish descent. She's an Israeli girl. And I can say more about the music if people are interested. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lawrence. I'm so glad you came. I'm going to ask you more about the mu uh, music afterwards. Um, yes, Hanan, please. Okay, thank you, Freddy, for this thing and history about Jewish in Sudan. Yes, I, I was born in Omdurman, and uh, my neighbors is called it Hosh Ishaq. It's a uh, big, 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 big families in Sudanese. And uh, just they, nobody, they, my, my mom, they call, I'm going to Hosh Ishaq, Hosh Israel. And nobody recognized it in that time. 
this is Jewish because it's mixed and married together and the culture and everything like Sudanese people. And just, I think it's big, big, big family in Sudan. They say Khalifa already about it and, and they growing us, with us and just uh, it looks like Sudanese, even the food and the culture and everything. And uh, I think it's so interesting to found this later is uh, Jewish, they moving in Sudan long, long, long years ago. And thank you for these things, and thank you for this information. Cheers. A Jewish young man here in, in London, and I, I'm in the, in the habit of talking to people. So I say I come from Sudan. And he said, surprising, my father was born in Khartoum. Oh, what's your name? Joshua. And he anglicized the name, El Ene. Of El Ene? What's El Ene? Of course, Murad Israel El Ene, one of the great people of the, Sudan, of the Jewish community in Sudan. He told me his father is still alive and living in, in um, the south of England. I talked to a region, her colleague, to see if they could get them to come and talk we to us. End. Unfortunately, it was too late. They couldn't get through to them. Have you had anything to, about Al Ain in your film? Yes, uh, actually, uh, the last sequence of the film in Geneva, mm. it's with this family. I see. And uh, I guess Murad is the brother of Ibrahim, uh, the man who passed away after we filmed uh, this sequence with the Taurus. I see. So uh, they're related, yes. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, speaking of Geneva, because we have a good friend there whose family was Jewish, but not. <laughs> you know Mindil, because our friend here mentioned Mindil, the yeah. Mindil family. Mm. There is a Salah Mindil, Dr. Salah Mindil, who lives in Geneva for the last 40 years. He, he worked for the WHO, the World Health Organization. His family, as it mentioned in this book, is one of two families who continue to be Muslims. Yes. They did not uh, go back to Judaism. And he's a nice man. I thought you could talk to him also. Mm. But uh, what about the Gaon f family? And so the I, and but going on on this, I would like to say something mm. about, uh, because here we have to talk <laughs> politics, unfortunately. And it was also mentioned in the book, because of the independence of Sudan and because of the Palestinian problem, which is still a, a vivid problem. And the people who were living in Sudan said they did not feel safe. Actually, I really felt a little bit offended by him saying mm -hmm. they did not feel safe and that his, his wife did not want to stay. In the book, he said they felt very safe. They had friends, and they, never, they were never endangered by anybody. So they preferred to leave uh, when they felt that Sudan was becoming independent because then Sudan is going to have its own opinion on international questions like the Palestinian. Later on, I certainly, I personally have been offended by Nimeris. Uh, you know, he was paid by Israel and by the United States to take those Falasha people from Ethiopia and transport them through Sudan to Israel. And I think he did approve those people. Israel is not really their country. They were very happy in Ethiopia like everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you. I did say it's going to be a very emotional feedback, didn't I? Thank you for sharing all these personal stories with us. Um, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, just want to uh, answer um, about the Gaon family. So, uh, so when I was in Geneva, I uh, was very, very well welcomed by the Tamam family and the Lieni family. I mean, it was really, I mean, outstanding. The access to the archives, uh, I was with them for two weeks. Uh, I, I, I had my first Shabbat with them. I mean, it was amazing. And then they were also celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, so they wanted me to come before the big party so I could do my work about the film and stay for the party and the party was amazing. I mean, you know, I was, I felt like I was part of the family and I didn't know them. So I'm um, very welcome people. 
So when I was in, in Geneva, um, Gabi Tamam uh, arranged a meeting uh, with uh, Nisim Gaum. And uh, so I met him, but I couldn't film him. He, he was not willing to be filmed. And I have to say, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm, 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 I'm a spiritual person. And, and when I met him, I mean, even though I met a lot of Sudanese Jew, you know, and they've got high position, and, but still they're very welcome, you know. You, you. But with Nisim Gaon, it was very special. I mean, it was different. I mean, I, I went to his office, and it was like a tiny room with a lot of, you know, religious things on the wall, and the, and and himself is very, you know, very spiritual, and the way he talks, and the, so uh, so I spent about an hour with him, and um, and the funny thing is, um, he was about the same age as uh, Jadala Jubara, and they went uh, to the army together when they were in their early twenties, and Jadala told me about Nisim Gaon, and then Nisim Gaon told me about Jala, Jadala Jubara. So it was uh, very emotional as well when I, when I was with Nisim Gaon because then it was a, at a very different level, you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, Jadala Jubara told me about the songs they were, you know, they, they share during their time in the army together. And I mentioned that to Nisim Gaon and then he remembered and then, so it was, it was very special, yeah. yeah. But he didn't want to be filmed and uh, to he be, respected yeah. That. yeah. Thank you. I forgot to mention that we have got a copy of uh, Jadalla Jubara Film films as well. well. Yeah. So if you'd like to have it, just ask for it. Thank you so much for this lovely evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.